U.S. we have a tradition, have become a very complicated tradition, but uh, a signifying one that um, is to first recognize the people who stand for our honor. And I have much to learn in South Africa, but I, I want to start first um, with an acknowledgement and a gratitude to ancestors and to land and to people because um, that we were able to sit and have a conversation about the world in this moment. Uh, most people don't have that luxury. And, um, and I think that while we are in this circumstance and positionality that we are, um, if we are always in remembrance and in honor of those who are not in the physical space, then um, we begin to um, have uh, the chance of an honest and um, responsible engagement. Um, uh, I will also say that this, um, this presentation draws from many years of sort of developing thinking about the relationship between all um, different things, which you'll see. And so the Everyday Forms of Whiteness book uh, had a chapter on the American um, tensions in the American dream, which Rod and I uh, wrote together and spoke with over 100 people in the US about uh, what their third thoughts were. Um, and then I continued to uh, you know, as things unfold globally and nationally, I uh, have continued to think about the role and the relationship, in a way, of, of the U.S. and this American dream, American dream, um, to come to the maintenance of coloniality, really, and uh, structures, ideologies, practices, social relations. So I, I want to just nod to Rod, who passed at the end of 2013. Uh, any conversation that, I am, that I'm having with you now, he's a part of. So um, I want to recognize that. So diversity and the American dream. It's called the American dream because you have to be asleep to believe it. And when you are asleep, you discover, in fact, it's not a dream. I'm gonna just briefly tell you the sections of what I'll go over. Um, I look to learn as much as I will offer. And so, um, uh, three broad sections. One is around historical foundations, the modern world systems, modality, the centrality of eth ethnic and racial hierarchies, 20th century challenges. Second section, dream matters desperately in need of a dream, nation of immigrants, a dream emerges, Such structural implosion and the crumbling of US exceptionalism. And then the conclusion, the moral exhaustion of America. I'll explain this, and I'll stop it, but just know every time I say America, I'm gonna go like this. <laughs> <laughs> the moral exhaustion of America, the beautiful tension so how I organized this, um, uh, thanks to Sam, like profound thanks uh, for all of the correspondence and so forth, is to offer you sort of highlights of ideas along that sort of broad outline. And then I look to whatever conversation that you would like to have. Um, and as I said, I think much of this you already know. If you don't know in here, you know in here. Um, I hope that uh, what I offer is uh, perhaps some glimpse from the belly of the beast um, and that perspective. So historical foundations. Uh, I, I'll say just straight uh, to assert that to understand the modern world and the emergence of the United States we need to recognize the inherent connections between coloniality, capitalism, imperialism, white supremacy, or Obama. 
heteronormative patriarchy and the emergence of the U.S. nation as a supposed city on the hill and hegemonic imperial power structured at inception by a racial hierarchy. With these dominant and hegemonizing uh, structures and ideologies constitute a common sense and a systemic reality depth deeply in need of interrogation, rupture, and transformation. We in this room know that. They form the political, economic, and social historical foundation of the founding of the Americas, the positioning of Africa in the world system, the emergence of the United States, and ultimately are the defining foundation of the rhetoric of an American dream. This continues to be true even as the structural precepts increasingly organize U.S. society and the globe along a path where upward mobility is less and less the reality, even for those groups who are provided temporary access. Coloniality, Americanity, and white supremacy. Nations exist in a world scale system of inequality ordered around the ideology of pan-European racism derived from the colonization of the Americas and subsequently the globe. During this period, the idea of race was invented to naturalize the power and assert the superiority of Europeans, and through enslavement to establish Africans as the core labor force in the New World and extractivism of the land of indigenous process involved the construction of a socio-economic political system asserting polarities, divisions, hierarchies, ideologies, epistemologies to justify and rationalize zones as Manonse of being and not being. In this way, white world supremacy has formed the structural ideological bedrock of the modern world system, capitalist world economy, and U.S. national hegemonic positioning. The founding of the Americas. Kihano and uh, Anuba Kihano and Emmanuel Wallerstein argue that the creation of the geosocial entity called the Americas was the constitutive act of the modern world system along with the destruction of the indigenous populations that attended the birth of the modern world system, Americanity was associated with modernity and identified as the new world. Four elements distinguish this new world and the Americas from the old world. Coloniality, ethnicity, racism, and the concept of newness itself they say coloniality was essentially the creation of a set of states linked together with an interstate system in hierarchical layers. This system manifested itself in all domains, political, social, and not least of all cultural. This hierarchy reproduced itself over time in geographic areas. There was always some mobility for a few. In this way, coloniality was essential to the integration of the interstate system, creating a ranking order, rules for interaction among states, and social relations within nation states themselves. Founding of the United States, not America. Not America. The United States, America has more than uh, uh, 34 countries. And the equation of the United States and America is part of the problem. The founding principles asserted in much of the nation's mainstream historiography neither conform to the perspectives of the settlers, who were not immigrants, nor were those who were enslaved, nor to their practices, which were based on clear principles of the inclusion of some and exclusion of others 
from the very inception. These included the ideals, for example, that all men are created equal, not, and that we, the people, have rights to liberty, safety, opportunity, and democracy. Absolutely not. These perspectives and practices have not been the exceptions to the rule, as is often argued. Exclusion is and has been the rule. This systematic, this is systemic, systematic, as well as structurally, institutionally, materially, and ideologically embedded. The children who were murdered this week in Texas were murdered precisely because the system works, not because it's broken. With the rise of fascism in the US and globally, violence and chaos serve the elite well. Any notions of America, the beautiful, a nation of immigrants who consciously forged a new El Dorado, a city on a hill, a beacon of light to all in the world, a magical land like no other that offered opportunity to all those willing to work hard enough. Those myths have always been a fabrication. The centrality of ethnic and racial hierarchies. Kehano and Wallace also argue that is precisely the emergent position of strength within the world economy that made the practice and ideologies of segregation and white supremacy necessary as the structural and ideological ways to justify exploitation, oppression, and the other social hierarchies. The upper stratum, as a percentage of the total population, was growing too fast, providing opportunities for upward mobility for larger numbers, particularly among Euro-descended groups. And the informal constraints of ethnicity were not up to the task of maintaining workplace and social hierarchies. As a result, formal racism, black codes, Jim Crow, scientific racism became a further contribution, if you call it, of Americanity to the world system. These developments were then critical to the formalization of global whiteness itself, including the history making of white people and the further entrenchment of colonial, capitalist, white supremacist, this heteronormative, patriarchal global order. 20th century challenges. While initially functional, post-World War II, the system of formal racism was not compatible with the US social and geopolitical realities after the nation's ascension to the hegemonic position within the world system. The US that sought to separate and insulate itself from the affairs of Europe operated on a different logic than the ones concerned with matters of world power. <clears throat> These circumstances created the opening the African-American-led civil rights movement to push for challenges to the Jim Crow system of the Georgia segregation. This fight was of enormous symbolic value in forcing the United States to end this obvious contradiction to its democratic presentations, especially given its new mantle as the leader of the so-called free world. However, most engaged in the fight for racial equality understood that there was a deeper layer to racial equality beyond the struggle against de jure segregation. Migra migration and the third world within. The strength of the US economic position also made it necessary that the US expand widespread legal and illegal immigration from non-European countries. This combination of the internally colonized populations of African, Mexican, Puerto Rican, Native American, and various Asian populations with the new immigrants created a phenomenon that came to be called by some observers the third world within. Furthermore, 
that the federal government recognizes 537 indigenous tribes in the U.S., not including those that are state recognized or those without political recognition, represents a clear nation, a, a clear example of nations within a nation and an ongoing colonial endeavor. Over the short run, these social dynamics have pushed large sections of the dominant white ethnic working classes to the right. Over the longer term, it polarized the society in such a way that even the nationalism of empire could not overcome the obvious weakening position of the social arrangements of civilization. It wasn't up to the task the social arrangements of subordination upon which the dominant strata depends. Racism without races. The situation thus calls for a more subtle, theoretically subtle, certainly not for uh, oppressed, exploited, <coughs> subordinated communities, but calls for a more subtle public practice of racism and ideological of discourse that reinforced but didn't openly expose it. Racism took refuge in what seemed to be the opposite, universalism and the concept of meritocracy. For example, examination systems deemed neutral. In the US, it's a graduate a record exam, a scholastic achievement uh, exams. These are deemed neutral within an ethnic hierarchy that just dis inevitably, disproportionately favor the upper ethnic strata because of the underlying inequalities at all levels. You know, in the US, school districts are funded by the tax base of the neighborhood. By the tax base. Very simple structural um, way that this happens. And then they can say, oh, well, you know, everyone comes to the test on equal footing. In this way, capitalism's commandments are deeply embedded in the 20th century US psyche, all predicated on a deeply racial and genocidal foundation. These include, for example, the commandment that greed is good, never show empathy or compassion, the purpose of, purpose of life is to conquer. Part of this, um, corresponding to the rise of what is known as the culture of poverty explanations, um, or rise, the rise of explanations for racial inequality that were deemed nothing to do with racism. Hence the possibility of arriving in a post-racial society with a deeply entrenched racial structure were presumed to be inevitable. The anthropologist Oscar Lewis' work on the devastating cultural ravages of capitalism upon the all too human impoverished victims of its inherently polarizing economic regime were revived by the mainstream talking heads who framed it as an explanation of why the poor were unable to succeed in a society, uh, unable to succeed because of their cultural deficit where they assert there's equal opportunity for all who are willing to work hard. Just, uh, the notion of who works hard. Consequently, racist attitudes appear justified without needing to explicitly verbalize them. Racial coding became so routine. Even today, uh, there's a, uh, an article by Etzel and Etzel, when the official sub subject is presidential politics, taxes, welfare, crime, rights, or values, the real subject is race. That an ethnic stratum that performs poorly was considered inferior appeared as an obvious fact. Section two, read matters. How ironic is it that the very system that systematically discriminates touts lack of bias. Robert Aaron Wright said, ours is a society 
that routinely gen generates destitution and then perversely relieves its conscience by vilifying the destitute. So this convergence of the, of the structural, the material, the global uh, necessitated a dream, desperately needed a dream. The possibility of advancement thus became part of the logic of the lower stratum inserted into these new conditions. However, the assumption of potential was much less present, obviously, for the formerly enslaved and Jim Crow racialized strata. Populations inhabiting a parallel universe operating according to different social principles develop their own perspectives in accordance to their own conditions. As from inception and the founding of the United States, not all groups have had the same relation to nation. And by extension, not everyone outside the US is viewed through the same lens. This is painfully evident. For example, in longstanding discourse practices related to the inequalities and injustice within all institutions of society, immigration policies, notions of belonging, educational systems, and all justice systems, and so forth. Condescending expressions of the more privileged social strata harden the hearts of those embraced by whiteness towards their less fortunate co-residents. The process dulled their social sensitivities, leading them to blame individuals and communities for the fate established by systematically imposed structural inequalities. This exemplifies the ideology and practice of white supremacy. Not a nation of immigrants. In the book by this title, Roxanne Dunbar Ortiz eloquently documents the reality that the United States of America was born of the theft of indigenous land, the capture and enslavement of Africans for labor, the conquest of Mexican territory, the imperial intervention in Cuba and the Philippines, and throughout what is arrogantly referred to with little self-reflection as the US backyard. The geopolitical and geocultural elements of our social world are fundamental and not ancillary to the global stratification order, as well as the political, economic, and social hierarchies within the US. Some assert this racial domination as a form of internal colonialism, uh, not as a colonial analogy, but part of the core reality of the modern world system, the contradiction between the imagery and the rhetoric about the character of nation and the realities was part of the US national psyche from, from the beginning. This predicament of the rhetoric versus the reality of equality and inequality in the United States had long standing roots. How long could the romanticized imagery remain untarnished by the facts and unquestioned in mainstream discourse? Just one century after its creation, the nation state had expanded to become a global power with established pattern of territorial imperial conquest and expansion by the mid 20th century. Oh, by the mid 20th century, it was recognized as the hegemonic actor within the world system. As such, the nation was challenged to reckon with how contradictions within its own borders reflected its position as the world leader. The struggle, the nation struggled with the question of how its position and perceived in this era of and many of the anti-colonial struggles occurring around the ground were aligned with the internal movements for social change among marginalized populations. How could the rhetoric of democracy be rationalized as imperial interventions around the globe intensified? How could the demands for justice, inclusion, access be reconciled with the military interventions, 800 US military bases around the globe being engaged and the use of violence, both structural and material, within its borders. It took almost an hour for intervention in Texas. He shot the grandmother of 
his grandmother and the thieves and she crawled. He overturned a truck and people called. He entered the school and people called. A dream emerges. During the 1930s, the notion of American dream became a central component of the image of America itself. The idea of upward mobility for all became a part of the nation's self-conception, different from the idea of freedom, um, which was limited to the resources at one's command. The, uh, the American dream was definitively defined and shaped by one's positionality in the social hierarchy. The dream was considered reachable by anyone who tried hard enough, despite very rigid inequalities structuring all aspects of U.S. life. It was considered achievable with hard work lack of, and lack of effort. Cultural sophistication or intelligence was asserted as the cause of failure. Mainstream claims included that Americans, only some though, of course, was, are superior beings in the global context. That a true American is white of European descent that we need an equality and competition so people are motivated to work. Do note the convergence of these ideas with capitalist values and ideologies and how much they serve corporate, elite, dominant interests. Resistance or objection to these narratives has been considered anti-American and ungrateful, seditious, asserted by those unwilling, un unable to do the hard work to achieve upward mobility. And after 9-11, this was very, very, very evident that anyone raised any question or anyone talked about the chickens coming home to roost or any complicity of the US nation was labeled seditious and faced uh, uh, punishment acknowledging the historical realities that have led to the betterment of living conditions for some, in contrast to those of other people around the world, is also outside the bounds of acceptable everyday conversation. Structural forces that shape social realities are almost entirely, and, and I say almost just just for the sake of saying it, are rendered invisible. Structural implosion. It was one thing to promote this idea, endless possibility when the economy was expanding and another as the wealth and income gap began to significantly grow in the 1970s. Since that time, the skewed pattern of income distribution and worldwide has led to ongoing and massive increases in the increase of the top 10, especially top 1% uh, of the world population, the population of the US, yet a decline in real income of much of the rest of the population. This trend has intensified in the last two decades, and to many people's surprise, though maybe perhaps not in this room, even during the COVID pandemic, an article entitled, COVID Can't Stop Corporate Profits from Climbing to Record Highs, notes that tax cuts and government assistance to corporations provided a huge boost. U.S. corporations pulled in more profits in the three ends that ended in September 2020 than ever before. Not just in dollar terms, but as a share of the economy. They also note that tax corporate profits amounted to 11% of the gross domestic product. Before 10, 2010, they've uh, never gone over 9%. And why think? Um, taxes were cut on the very wealthy and the, continuously, and raises in the federal minimum wage became rare. Protected workers' wages were dismantled as many other forms of workers' rights. As we can probably have seen with the uh, recent Supreme Court move around Roe v. Wade, 
CEO, uh, CEO uh, worker pay ratios in 2020 averaged 830 times the pay of an average worker. The racial wealth gap has also significantly widened. In 2019, the median black family had 24,000 in wealth, only 12% of the 189,000 in wealth owned by the typical white family. Many, many, uh, many workers were uh, forced to work remote. However, even this was very, um, there were just differences. Uh, only 19% uh, of black and 16% of Latinas people work in jobs where they're able to tell the truth. <laughs> <clears throat> almost 30% of white and uh, almost 40% of Asian workers. These disparities are also evident in significantly lower home ownership rates, higher student debt, underrepresentation at the top, and lower uh, over in lower levels of income tiers, particularly around, around black and Native American. Uh, a recent study showed that black mortgage uh, applicants are 84% more likely to be denied this, this year, the crumbling of U.S. exceptionalism. The wealth of the U.S. is most often explained as an outcome of being the greatest country in the world with more modernity, more technology, more efficiency, more liberty, more culture, more democracy. The notion of this superiority is deeply ingrained in the American psyche and provides the context for why a dream and the idea that upward mobility and material success are accessible to all would be considered particularly American. However, the U.S. decline was as large. The substance of the American dream has been shaken, even among some who most vigorously defend its possibility. Among young people, only a Pew Research Survey uh, noted that only 10% maintain that the U.S. stands above all other countries. The multiple political and economic crises signify a precarious area er, era made worse by the COVID pandemic and the ruling class determination to continue expanding profits, increasing unemployment, greater numbers at uh, food banks, soup kitchens. Where I live in central Brooklyn, you can't walk without seeing people lined with their bags. In 20, while in 2019, 11% of families in the US faced food insecurity, that doubled in 2020 to one in four. And we all know who is represented in even higher proportions, and that's the black and brown communities in the U.S. Black and brown, black families are more than twice as likely. 36% face food insecurity in the United States. These trends are compounded by expanding privatization of all social services to the extent that schools, medical facilities, and policing have largely become profit-bearing spaces, as opposed to services delivered for the public good. Some American communities opposing the moral exhaustion of American communities. In the last de decades, increasing inequalities and long struggles over racial justice have undermined support for the belief in this so-called dream, which had been a symbol of the a special character of the United States. How could this rhetoric as a land of opportunity be reconciled with a quarter of the nation's population, or in some cases, a third of the nation's population being food insecure? Simultaneously, though, a portion of the US population, most specifically whites, and not only working class, Whites, 
has become more convinced of the righteousness of white supremacy and their, their determination to defend the fu their future based on uh, defending white supremacy, even as their conditions have deteriorated as well. The, the empire's unraveling began to occur with the increasing social power of racial minorities during the 60s and 70s. However, this conjuncture was not destiny, but a familiar power in geopolitics sometimes difficult to recognize because of the premise of US exceptionalism. A key component of the dream is meritocracy, embedded in all narratives of the US nation. The dramatic increase in the social power of the racialized and gendered lower strata, particularly significant if, as an economic uh, and political social crisis, gave mainly, uh, though not all, cause to reevaluate the rhetoric. Continuing profit squeeze, labor strife, are exacerbated by transformations in the global labor force and a geopolitical crisis by the continuing uh, aftermath of the US defeat in Vietnam has created an environment that increased vulnerability for the majority. It's an imperial nation, the underbelly of the shining city on a hill. What is a city that shines only on parts of the hill and only at times? The whole world is rising in rebellion against the domination of the economic elites and the domination of the rich straight states of the pan-European world. Whether it's the 250 million Indian farmers who are on strike this past year against brutal laws or the progress, rise of progressive politics in Latin America, it's evident, or even uh, the many uh, forms of struggle right within South Africa, it's evident in the day is dawning. Colonial Catholic system is in an irrevocable decline. However, the forces at the top are determined to maintain it by any means necessary. The centrality of the U.S. nation to coloniality and the centrality of the uh, social relations within the U.S. Um, means that you, American society and the form premise of the American dream are being exposed as fallacies built on the social relations of coloniality and power. Um, Malcolm X had argued he did not see the American dream but an American nightmare which captured the true meaning of the creed as the possession of the U.S. elites. There's rich because they well, part of the, from uh, two quotes from this, there's rich because there's poor, and that's the way I put it. Inequality exists because some people want something for nothing. I strongly agree that some people, in this case, want to make money off the rest of us in exchange for nothing, or exchange actually for the political contributions they use to buy the government. Indeed, James Baldwin said, to end the racial not nightmare, we must never forget that the agency of those social groups whose critical consciousness is instilled in them by their own histories and struggles, not as intellectuals and activists, but as people, is absolutely central to building a system that is democratic, egalitarian, and just. The notion of an American dream has distorted and distracted us for far too long. It is time for a dream that leaves no hungry, houseless, no one in harm's way. That is fully possible. The resources exist on Earth to do so. However, the foundation of society would need to be rooted in values of justice, of community, truth that emanate from those most vulnerable, for only when they are free can we all be free. And true, legitimate dreams become reality. Frederick Douglass, in my closing quote, says, whether we turn to the declarations of the past or the professions of the present, the conduct of the nation seems equally hideous and revolting. For America is false to the past, false to the present, and solemnly binds herself to be false 